Hello investors and welcome to my YouTube channel where I study the best investors and businesses from around the world. In this week's video we'll be taking a look at the Postal Savings Bank of China. Today's video is broken up into four key parts. Number one, the broad landscape of banking in China. Number two, the history of the Postal Savings Bank of China. Number three, the growth of PSBC. Number four, the five crucial things to know about China's Postal Savings Bank. Li Lu is a well-known value investing guru who has been featured on this channel several times. At the 2019 annual meeting of the Daily Journal Corporation, a Los Angeles publishing and technology firm that Charlie Munger chairs, Munger revealed that he entrusts his fortune to someone other than his Berkshire partner, and that person is Li Lu. I'm 95 years old. I've given Munger money to some outsider to run once in 95 years, and that's Li Lu. Munger explained why this investor has appealed to him in a way no others have in nearly a century. He's partly a Chinese Warren Buffett. That really helps, he said. Partly, he's fishing in China, not in this over-searched, over-populated, highly competitive American market. Li Lu's style of investing is similar to that of Buffett and Munger. He takes concentrated positions in businesses with a large margin of safety and holds on for the long term. Therefore, the fact that Li Lu has about $1 billion invested in the Postal Savings Bank of China is important to note. Li and Munger both believe some of the best investment opportunities available today are to be found in China. At the 2019 annual meeting of the Daily Journal, Munger remarked that the strongest companies in the world are not in America. He went on to add that I think Chinese companies are stronger than ours and are growing faster. Want to find out why Chinese companies and especially the Postal Savings Bank hold so much power? Stay tuned to find out. First, let's take a look at the broad landscape of banking in China. Investors in the United States are probably more wary of China now than they've been in decades. Relations between the two countries are tense, and the prospect of a broader fallout from the struggle of Chinese real estate behemoth China Evergrande Group hangs in the balance of the market. In terms of the direction of financial regulation, China and the United States have been living in two different worlds for the better part of the last decade, and this is likely to continue for some time. One reason why this is important is that Chinese banks are playing an increasingly important international role, making it necessary to coordinate financial regulatory approaches while taking into account the differences in national circumstances. The banking system in the People's Republic of China, or PRC, was historically monopolized by the People's Bank of China, PBOC, first as the only bank, then later as the central bank of the PRC. After China started its economic reform and began opening up in 1978, and since the early 1980s, China has gradually opened its banking industry to embrace diversified ownerships and sophisticated businesses. The Chinese banking system is still evolving under various reforms. In the early 1980s, the government allowed four state-owned specialized banks to accept deposits and conduct banking business, namely the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, the China Construction Bank, or CCB, the Bank of China, or BOC, and the Agricultural Bank of China, ABC. In 1986, the Bank of Communications, BCM, offered for business after being restructured into the first state-owned joint stock commercial bank. Since then, ICBC, CCB, BOC, ABC, and BCM have secured their positions as the five largest commercial banks in the PCR, measured by gross assets. In addition, the Postal Savings Bank of China is now regarded as the sixth state-owned large commercial bank. These six banks have all conducted initial public offerings, IPOs, and have diversified their state ownership to the public. Despite these IPOs, they're all still majority owned by the central government. 
To encourage constructional, industrial, and agricultural development, in 1994, China established three policy banks to fulfill special lending services for construction projects, import and export companies, and the agricultural sector. There are also banks in China dedicated to rural areas of the country. In addition, foreign banks are allowed to establish subsidiaries and branches in China and to make strategic investments in Chinese-funded commercial banks. Today, all banks in China are under the supervision of the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission and can be broken up into four types of banks. Number one, policy banks. China has three policy banks. These are Agricultural Development Bank of China, China Development Bank, and Exim Bank of China. Number two, state-owned commercial banks. China has six state-owned commercial banks. These banks are ranked by their Tier 1 capital amount as of 2018. Postal Savings Bank of China has the most outlets of any retail bank in China, around 40,000. Over 80% of its outlet companies in China Post post offices. Number three, commercial banks. China has 12 national commercial banks. These banks are ordered by their Tier 1 capital amount as of 2018. They are China Merchants Bank, Shanghai Podong, Development Bank, Industrial Bank, China CITIC Bank, China Minxing Bank, China Everbright Bank, Ping An Bank, Huxia Bank, China Gongfa Bank, Chinese Zhishang Bank, China Bohai Bank, and Hingfeng Bank slash ever-growing bank. Number four, private banks. There are also five internet or private banks in China. WeBank, the first private bank and internet bank in China, initiated by Tencent. MyBank, the internet bank of China, established by Ant Financial Services Group. Shanghai Hurai Bank, and Wenzhou Mengsheng Bank, and Liaoning Zingjing Bank, Let's take a moment to discuss this fourth type of bank, since WeBank and MyBank are owned by Tencent and Alibaba, and they are in the news lately. Since 2014, the government has also promoted the participation of private capital in the financial sector. To date, 19 privately owned banks have been approved, including internet banks such as Zhejiang e-commerce bank and Shenzhen WeBank, these two banks were founded by the internet giants Alibaba and Tencent to provide internet financial services. Asia's digital banking market is ripe for expansion. New digital players are shaking up the sector and altering banking for individuals and businesses as demand for online and mobile options grows. As authorities raise license allocations and define standards for a new generation of banking, Incumbent and new entrants alike have a unique opportunity to participate. Of course, not every Asian digital bank is a success story, but those who have created a viable business model and scaled successfully have done well. Digital banks, once established, can earn larger revenues at a cheaper cost of service than incumbents, allowing them to grow market share. Furthermore, its digital architecture allows them to access ecosystems of enterprises and customers, resulting in exponential knowledge and data benefits. While digital banks in other regions are frequently startups, established firms and consortia are driving Asian digital banking. They offer substantial advantages in terms of gaining size, notwithstanding fundamental obstacles in governance, WeBank, which is funded by Tencent, has 200 million customers, and MyBank, which is backed by Alibaba, has more than 20 million SME customers just five years after its establishment. Digital banking in Asia, like many other places, is competitive, and many businesses have either failed to scale or scaled but not profitably. Asian digital banking, on the other hand, has been a resounding success. Jibon Bank, Japan's first Asian digital purely play funded in 2018, became profitable in less than five years. Two years after its launch, 
China's We Bank and XW Bank, as well as South Korea's Kauko Bank, all earned positive returns. In 2019, all five Chinese digital banks were profitable, with WeBank and XW Bank reporting ROEs of around 28% and 30% respectively, compared to a national average of around 11% for all banks. In contrast to the vertical approach seen in Europe and the United States, successful digital banks in Asia frequently operate under a consortia business model. Now for the second part of this video, we will take a look at the history of the Postal Savings Bank of China. The postal savings business in China can be traced back to its start in 1919, but went public with backing from Tencent and Alibaba in 2016. With approximately 40,000 outlets and services covering over 600 million personal customers, the bank strategically focuses on providing financial services to Sinong customers, urban and rural residents, and SMEs, and is committed to meeting the financial needs of the most promising customers during China's economics transformation. In addition, with data-driven operations, channel coordination, wholesale retail engagement, and efficient operations, the bank is accelerating its transformation into a new retail bank. It is China's leading retail bank with high asset quality and tremendous growth potential. The bank is dedicated to serving the real economy, actively implementing the national development strategy, and supporting China's modern economic systems development with a focus on long-term sustainability. The bank follows the customer-centric philosophy and has built a financial service system that connects online and offline services for joint development, giving our customers more options, high-quality, convenient, and efficient integrated financial services. It takes a risk-based approach to asset management, investing in the development of a comprehensive risk management system that encompasses all aspects, the entire process, and the entire staff, and maintaining high asset quality. It continues to operate on the principle of covering both urban and rural areas and providing general public services, and it actively pursues its social responsibilities in the areas of inclusive finance, green finance, and targeted poverty alleviation. The bank has begun to play a larger and more influential role in the market after 14 years of dedicated efforts. It was ranked 22nd in the bankers list of top 1,000 world banks in terms of tier 1 capital in 2020. This year, it received A+, and A1 ratings from Fitch Ratings and Moody's Investor Services, which are the same as China's sovereign credit rating. Faced with a window of strategic opportunity for China's economic and social development, the bank will fully implement the new development concept, deepen reform and innovation across the board, and accelerate transformation and development towards uniqueness, comprehensiveness, lightness, digitalization, and intensiveness. It continues to improve the quality and efficiency of serving the real economy and ability to serve customers. Here is a timeline of the company. 1919, Postal Savings Bureau, the predecessor of Postal Savings Bank of China, was established to offer postal savings business. 1930, Postal Savings and Remittance Bureau was established. Since the start, Postal Savings Business has been adhering to the philosophy of working on the trivial work even others despise, working towards stability rather than a big profit thus winning the fame of the Bank of the People at the time. 1949. The Postal Savings and Remittance Bureau was taken over by the People's Post and operated under the unified guidance of the People's Bank of China. In 1950, the Postal Savings and Remittance Bureau was abolished and the Postal Savings business transformed into the agency services. Collecting personal deposits and non-operating group deposits of the public for banks, in 1953, while the postal savings business was suspended, the Bureau continued to offer remittance and exchange services. 1986. 
the postal savings business was resumed. By leveraging the advantages of postal outlets, the business widely took small amount deposits from individuals and raised more funds for the construction of the country. In 1994, Postal Savings commenced the Green Card Program, a system similar to the U.S. Green Card Scheme. It is China's permanent resident ID card, which allows foreigners to have a prolonged residence period compared to work visas. In 2001, Postal Savings was linked to the National Banking Network. 2007 Postal Savings Bank of China was officially established, strategically focusing on providing financial services to Sanong customers, urban and rural residents, and SMEs. Relying on the agency outlets of China Post Group, the bank established the unique self-operated plus agency operation model in the banking industry of China. 2012 Postal Savings Bank of China was transformed to a joint stock limited liability company. In 2015, the bank introduced 10 strategic investors from home and abroad. PSBC Consumer Finance Co. Limited was established and open for business. 2016, the bank completed the initial public offering on the main board of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and gained access to international capital markets. 2019, the bank was formally classified as a major state-owned commercial bank and listed successfully on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. PSBC Wealth Management Co. Limited was established and open for business. 2020, the bank obtained approval of establishment of PSBC Online, making it the first major state-owned commercial bank to participate in the direct banking pilot program. The bank obtained approval of establishment of the credit card center as a specialized institution. The third section of this video will focus on the growth of PSBC. PSBC is a commercial retail bank headquartered in Beijing that was founded in 2007. It specializes in providing basic financial services to small and medium-sized businesses, as well as rural and low-income customers. PSBC had 39,798 branches as of December 31st, 2017, covering all of China. In 2007, the State Post Bureau established PSBC with an initial capital of RMB 20 billion. It now has RMB 1.5 billion in deposits and after the Agricultural Bank of China, the second largest number of branches. The government took a variety of initiatives during the global financial crisis to guarantee that its national economic stimulus plan reached rural communities in particular. This includes using the microfinance services of the Postal Savings Bank as a vehicle for national development and poverty reduction. The bank also helps China's credit cooperatives with their microcredit programs because of its vast reach. To make holdings of Singapore, UBS, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, the International Finance Corporation, Morgan Stanley, DBS Bank, Tencent, Anti-Financial Services Group, China Life, and China Telecom all invested 45.1 billion yuan in China Postal Savings Bank through the issuance of ProFloat stock on December 8, 2015. At the time of purchase, these strategic investors owned a 16.92% stake in the company. On September 30th, 2016, the stock was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange through an initial public offering. It was the largest unlisted Chinese bank prior to its IPO. Postal Savings Bank of China Co., the country's sixth largest lender by assets and headed by vice presidents and co-executive director Zhiwen Zhang and Hong Lao raised $7.4 billion in its Hong Kong initial public offering. This makes it the biggest IPO globally since Chinese online shopping giant Alibaba Group Holding Ltd.'s $25 billion debut in September 2014. PSBC has the most banking outlets in China as of June 2019, according to the most recent public figures. 
It had 39,680 stores, of which 31,735 are agency owned by its parent China Post. Because of its focus on retail banking, PSBC has the largest net interest margin among the six major state-owned commercial banks. PSBC was founded in March of 2007 in conjunction with China's Postal Savings Management Reform, and it was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in September 2016. China Post Group Corporation, a state-owned corporation that operates mainland China's postal service, is PSBC's largest and controlling stakeholder, with a 68.92% interest. PSBC's unique operating model, which includes both directly operated banking outlets and agency outlets run by China Post Group, is the primary cause for the bank's superior branch network. With the exception of PSBC, no other Chinese banks are permitted to operate agency bank shops. PSBC pays China Post Group and its provincial branches a deposit agency fee in exchange for the agency services they perform in collecting deposits on PSBC's behalf. In the past, agency outlets operated by China Post Group took customer deposits, but they did not offer lending services. PSBC is currently piloting microfinance lending services at its agency outlets in six provinces, with plans to further extend lending services to all 31,735 agency outlets nationwide in the future. This should help PSBC to further grow its lending business leveraging on the agency outlets. PSBC is one of China's largest retail banks. It's 589 million retail banking customers are second only to the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, which has over 600 million retail banking customers. This is due in large part to PSBC's network of about 40,000 banking outlets, which is the greatest among Chinese banks as mentioned before. The net interest margins of the other big five state-owned banks are below 2% for Bank of Communications and Bank of China, and 2.1% to 2.3% for Agricultural Bank of China, China Construction Bank, and Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. PSBC's retail banking sector could benefit in the short term from the expansion of loan services to its agency stores across the country. Retail banking in China may remain underserved in the medium to long term. For example, in 2018, China had only 0.49 credit cards per capita, whereas most industrialized countries have at least one credit card per person. PSPC is a primary beneficiary of potential expansion in retail banking penetration in the country, thanks to its extensive network of banking branches across the country. We will end today's video with five crucial things to know about China's Postal Savings Bank. Number one, it is the biggest bank by branches in China. Postal Savings Bank has 505 million customers and operates more than 40,000 branches across pretty much everywhere in China, from isolated rural areas to Beijing and Lhasa. This means it has the biggest distribution network in the country's banking industry with nearly double the number of branches run by Agricultural Bank of China Limited, the country's second biggest by branches. The branches are mostly at post offices owned by China's Post Group, its controlling shareholder. Number two, the company has some big name investors behind it. A roster of high profile backers bought $7 billion worth of shares in the bank in a pre-IPO round of financing in December 2015. These included JP Morgan Chase & Co, UBS Group AG, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, Temes Holdings, Alibaba's financial affiliate Ant Financial, and Tencent Holdings Limited. It has touted these strategic relationships in its IPO pitch as a means of modernizing its business and bringing its performance more in line with its global peers. The collaboration with Tencent and Ant Financial is notable here since the state bank has the largest branch network and signed its strategic cooperation agreement with fintech giant Ant Financial. The pact with the Alibaba-backed financial firm 
will focus on areas such as digital payments, online lending, rural finance, and corporate finance. The partners will also set up a joint lab to explore fintech innovations and extend tie-ups in areas such as internet security and taking bank branches digital. Number three, the bank is still relatively new to making loans. While China's postal savings business began in 1919, the bank itself was only set up in 2007. This makes it the youngest of China's large commercial lenders and means it is relatively early in developing its loan book, another key selling point in the IPO. This also means it has far lower ratio of bad loans to performing loans on its books. Still, some investors have expressed concern about its $37.2 billion exposure to China's Railway Corp, its biggest borrower, which could face problems if China's slowdown impacts the country's construction of railways. Number four, buying shares in the bank wasn't cheap. Postal Savings Bank's bigger Chinese state bank peers trade at discounts ranging from 10% to 30% of book value, a company's assets minus its liabilities. That means investors in Postal Savings Bank, which priced above book value, were being asked to pay a big premium for the Chinese lender's shares. This is mainly because China's state-owned companies followed an unwritten rule that they should price their IPOs at or above book value. Number five, it's shelling out more than $100 million in fees to its banks. Postal Savings Bank is set to pay out more than $100 million in fees to banks that worked on its IPO, while five lead banks including Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated and Morgan Stanley are likely to receive the lion's share of those proceeds. Another 12 banks that worked in other roles on the deal will also be waiting in line to take their cut. Still, the offering would likely have been more expensive to launch in New York, where banks are typically paid 6% to 7% fee for underwriting IPOs compared with the up to 1.6% of the funds raised that will go to underwriters of the Postal Savings Bank. This brings us to the conclusion of today's video, and we will leave you with one final thought from both Li Lu and Munger. In his talks with Greenwald, Lu discussed why he believes China is such an attractive market for value investors. I think China is one of the best markets in the world if you are a value investor. In a sense, the market is still underdeveloped. It is not representative of the real economy in the same way as it is in the United States. The trading and investors are not as mature. There's still this mentality of faster trading and high turnover, which drives companies through this faster pace of boom and bust. This usually provides opportunities for patient investors who truly know the value of businesses. Li Lu. Similarly, Munger has previously advised investors to fish where the fish are, or look for investments in the world's fastest growing economies, and it's clear to see that China fits this brief to a T. What are your thoughts on PSBC? If you have more information about PSBC, please let me know in the comments below for a deeper dive. Thank you for watching this video all the way through. Nothing helps me out more than y'all sticking it out until the end, so please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already done so. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe so that I can continue to make content for you to enjoy.